Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Meena Raman from Third World Network to discuss the climate change negotiations. Meena, good to have you with us. Very happy to be here. The climate change negotiations seems to be completely deadlocked. The way it's looking, the pledges that are being made by the developed countries were supposed to have cut some significant amounts by 2012, haven't done their job. They're not willing to make further commitments, and the commitments they're making are so weak. There's really no chance of saving the globe from more than a two degree, for a two degree rise. Where do you think the current negotiations are going? Well, you have said it. You said it was deadlocked. Unfortunately, it's looking very bleak for those of us who were in Cancun. And even prior to Cancun, if you remember the Copenhagen process where the accord, the 26 um, you know, prime ministers or heads of states who were convened in that small room, um, they did not succeed in uh, adopting the Copenhagen Accord. But unfortunately, Cancun appeared to have legitimized the Copenhagen Accord. And for those of us who have watched that process, um, we are witnessing a moment of a very bleak uh, future in the climate negotiations. Um, when the convention was uh, uh, mooted in 1992 and ratified subsequently, and then we had the Kyoto Protocol born, um, the Kyoto Protocol was a son or a daughter of the convention, and it was supposed to rectify the implementation deficit in relation to the mitigation aspect of the climate negotiations because the developed countries were doing very little. So the Kyoto Protocol was actually a very key legally binding agreement. And uh, that first commitment period which was negotiated, which uh, began from 2008, expires in 2012. So one of the outcomes of Bali, which was very key, is the negotiation of the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol. And if you recall, the first commitment period was only about 5% emission reductions by 1990 for NX1 countries. Now, given the um, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change and the findings, and there was this whole euphoria, if you remember, that climate change was the most important phenomenon and that the world had to come together, which led to Copenhagen, um, the, the mood at that particular time was recognizing that the developed world had to do much, much more through legally binding cuts um, of a kind which would ensure that developing countries would then have the atmospheric space to undertake the cuts that they need, also to ensure that they had the finance and technology. But if the developed countries did not do what was historically res uh, responsible to do, then the developing world would not have a chance in terms of sustainable development. So the mood in Ken Bali was that the second commitment period of Kyoto was so key. But in Cancun, what, has hap what had happened was nearly a killing of the Kyoto Protocol. And by all, um, you know, uh, uh, conversations, the political agenda was very clear from the developed world. We are not going to stick to Kyoto. We are going to kill this legally binding treaty and replace it with a pledge system where it's not based on science, not based on equity, not based on a top-down legally binding setting of emission reduction cuts that have to be done but more like you are a gentleman, I am a gentlewoman, you decide what you want to do, which is politically feasible, I decide what's politically feasible, and then we will do. And then we will pledge and then we will review. So effectively what is coming out, let's do what we are willing to do. Exactly. And that, if it doesn't save the climate, just too bad. It seems to be the scenario building up to Durban. Yes. So can we take it the way that Durban is shaping up, is really putting the seal on finishing up the Kyoto Protocol as it stands, unless there is a major reversal of what we are seeing. Absolutely. And uh, that would really mean that unless, again, this pledge and review is stopped or reviewed and changed within a certain period, there's really no chance of meeting the two degrees centigrade, which is what people are talking about. Yeah, well, we, just to, for the record, even many of us in civil society are not even happy with the two degree world because what we say is a safer limit is really 1.5. But even with the pledges on the table that there are there and the unraveling of the Kyoto Protocol and replacing it with this very weak um, regime and that if that political mandate is got in Durban, then we are doomed for disaster. So I think what actually has happened since Cancun, there seems to be a fight back. 
the group of developing countries that negotiate under the G77 in China, at least in Bonn um, in June, made it very clear that the Kyoto Protocol is key. That for Durban, a second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol is key. Otherwise, there would be no negotiations further. Now, it remains to be seen how strong that unity is. And the other question is what the pledges would be. Because even in the Kyoto Protocol um, second commitment period, if the pledges are going to be very low, then we are in a hard time. You know, Mina, the other way of looking at it is the, the political scenario, the economic crisis in the West, the developing, developed countries, means there is no appetite today for doing anything on the climate. Also, it seems there is a lot of climate skeptics, a lot of ground the climate skeptic, the skeptics have gained in particularly the United States regarding climate change itself. Do you think that it is politically, it's becoming much more difficult to force such climate change negotiations, particularly given the mood in the developed countries, A, and B, do you think there is a possibility of aligning the crisis solution to climate change initiatives, like talking about green jobs, green economy, and so on? I think it's really a question that, that has to be asked of civil society around the world. I think in relation to political masters, I think if you leave it to the politicians, we will not get anywhere. I think what needs to be felt is a sense of outrage. And as we move towards Durban, I think there's a lot of uh, civil society, particularly African civil society movements, social movements have been gathering. And I think not many of us are hopeful about what will happen in Durban. But what we want to do is to at least use that opportunity to expose the, the, the politicians, um, particularly the United States. What we have been saying is leave the US out. That if Europe, could do a deal with the developing world. And if the, US, the, the Europeans have constantly uh, put themselves out as a climate champion, we never expected that of the United States. But if the European civil society allows its politicians to hide behind the United States, then we have tr trouble in our hands. So for those of us who are in the climate justice movement, I mean, Durban is a, uh, another touchstone. I mean, it's not the end of the world. This struggle, the climate justice fight goes on. But I do think that what we cannot let happen for Kyoto to die, to have the pledge and review will, but what we do need to do is to really up the ante in terms of huge momentum of mobilization. We don't expect anything from the US. But if we can keep the damage of the US, contain the US and say, don't, we don't expect you to lead. None of us expected them to lead. People thought that when Obama came in, there would be a change. But many of us saw Bush better than Obama simply because you knew you could get hell from Bush and therefore you did not want, I mean, you didn't expect the United States to lead. Well, that's a very interesting proposition that if Europe can detach itself from the United States in the climate change negotiations, it's never really happened except for the period that the US was out of the climate change negotiations completely. But the issue that Europe today faces is also the kind of austerity measures being forced on them. And therefore, the crisis of the European economy, particularly what we see in Greece, what we see in Spain, and what we are likely to see if we're not already seeing in Italy. Now, unless we can really couple the anger of the people against neoliberal economics to the issue of climate, unless we can bring these two issues together, Politically, it seems to be very difficult to shake. Otherwise, we'd be really setting them at cross purposes because people will say, we need money for jobs, we have no money for now climate. Now, that is, I think, also the challenge politically for all of us. Yeah. No, well, I think that those of us who are in this, in this fight don't see the, the disconnect. I mean, we see this as a paradigm fight. The climate crisis, the social crisis, the environmental crisis, the economic crisis, all as, all as one embedded in a systemic need for change. And that's why many of us say systemic change, not climate change. And so I do think that we come at, come at it from different angles. So I think this is the moment, not just for a reform, well, much more than for transformation in the way we do business, in the way we organize, in the way we produce, in the way we consume, all of which can have positive outcomes. So in a sense, it presents a lot of opportunity because it has shown that the market has failed. You can't rely on the, the corporate agenda. Globalization is really taken as all. I mean, this is all a cause. The, the, what we see is a, a, a response, both in terms of environment crisis, social crisis, environmental crisis, and economic crisis. So we see that clearly. So for us, it's not a disconnect. I mean, talking about consumption and lifestyle, I mean, 
I mean, Gandhi and, you know, I don't, I mean, I come from, from Malaysia and I insp I'm inspired by Mr. Gandhi. I'm not yeah, sure how but, many are, but. But in a sense that the Gandhian solution for Europe, if you ask people to go back to uh, the Gandhian solutions in that sense, even I, I would have some serious reservations on that, that you're really asking people to de-industrialize, to de-urbanize. The issue really is that it is important for us to present alternatives which are meaningful both in climate terms and societal terms to really get the climate change negotiations moving. No, again. absolutely. I think for those people who are in the negotiation to see it from a very technological fix it. Okay, we can use geoengineering or we can use this, that's not enough. And I do yeah, think that... The uh, geoengineering is a bit of a red herring because obviously <laughs> it's far more dangerous than exactly. uh, what it will fix. Exactly. And I don't think any serious scientific uh, group is actually proposing geoengineering. Yeah. So at the moment it's really an outlier even in all these discussions. But the real issue is that what we have seen is the economic crisis having partially derailed the climate movement in the West. And unless we really bring these two together, the people on the streets fighting the uh, kind of economic recession they are seeing, also demanding climate change and maybe climate jobs. Unless we do that, we are going to really have a difficult political time convincing the developed countries to come on board. Yeah, I think that's one of it. But the other, th the other thing that is helping us, unfortunately, is the climate itself. I mean, you can't ignore the fact that the extreme weather events have taken a toll on all our countries. So while you can temporarily forget and say, you know, um, we, we're not feeling the impact, that also is exacerbating the crisis that is there. So I do think that this is something that uh, we constantly have to have to come together. And, and the challenge is phenomenal. I do think that uh, it is huge. That's the other part. The northern countries tend to think climate warming very good for them. And even if it's bad for the rest of the world. But what they forget is the, as you said, the extreme weather events, yeah. which unfortunately or fortunately not sparing them either. Thank you, Meena. I'm sure on climate change negotiations, we'll get back to you again on as, as it progresses. Thanks. You're very welcome.